The story of Frank W. Woolworth, captain at the helm of that great industry, the five and ten cent store, is the most typical example in American history of the persistence, foresight, and courage which have been the characteristics of America's financial giants. Born at Rotman, New York, in poverty, he amassed a fortune and a reputation unique even among the greatest captains of industry. Five cents, please. A fortune built on nickels and dimes and one man's imagination and ability. How did he do it? Listen. How old are you, Woolworth? Well, 21, Mr. Augsburg. If I had any experience in clerking? Uh, no, no, sir. I've never had a chance to, but I believe I could. Daniel McNeil sent you over from Great Bend, New York, didn't he? Uh, yes, sir. You live there? Just outside of there, sir, on a farm. Well, why'd you leave the farm? Well, you see, we're kind of poor, and since my brother is old enough now to help with the work, that only makes me one more to feed. Well, you've no experience. You're only a greenhorn. We need men who know the business. Well, I only wish you'd give me a chance, sir. I've always wanted to be a clerk. I think I could do it. All I want is an opportunity. Uh, how old did you say uh, you were? 21, Mr. Moore. Well, there's no opening right now, Woolworth. But we might arrange it this way. We'll let you work here without salary for a year until you learn the business. And then we'll put you on steady. How does that strike you? Well, I'll have to have room and board, and that would take three fifty a week. Well, you can think it over. Then well, you now, listen, let... Mr. Moore. If you let me work here for three months for nothing, and then pay me three fifty a week for the rest of the year... I'll be glad of the opportunity of working for you. Oh, preposterous, impossible. <laughs> I, I'm not I so sure, Augsburg. I like his spirit. Yes, Woolworth, that can be arranged. You start tomorrow. Mr. Moore, I think you and Mr. Augsburg should take a try at this idea. Why, we could have those nickel sales every week and do very well with them. Mm, very interesting. Yes, indeed. Yeah, but it never worked. Well, how would you handle these sales? Well, get a lot of merchandise together, put it all on one table, and mark it, anything on this table, five cents. Why, the crowds would flock in. Why don't you try it? Well, maybe we will. I try it during the fair. How do you like that, Frank? Well, I think it's a wonderful idea, sir. This is where we really start something. Yes, sir, Mr. Moore, it's a great idea. <laughs> worth of merchandise on that table, and every piece of it sold out in less than three hours. Yes, sir. I knew it worked, sir. And say, I've got another idea. Why wouldn't a five and ten cent store selling nothing but five and ten cent articles do well, huh? I think it would. Well, why not find a location down the street and try it? I think we might make a go of it. Well, I'll tell you. You're an up-and-coming young fellow, and I believe you could make a success of it if you branched out on your own. On my own? <laughs> yes, sir. I'd like to try it, sir, but... But I've no money, sir. I know. The six dollars a week we pay you doesn't help much, does it? Well, suppose I lend you the money. Three hundred dollars. And suppose you try it out in Utica instead of here. What do you say? Yes, sir. And thanks, Mr. Moore. A million thanks. Three months later. Well, I failed, Mr. Moore. I guess I was wrong. I had faith in myself, but I'd failed. Not yet, Frank. Let's try again. Let's try in Lancaster this time and see what our luck is there. Six months later. We're showing a profit, Mr. Moore. And I've cleared enough to try another store in Harrisburg. Three months later. Well, the Harrisburg store has done well, Mr. Moore. I'm going to try again in Scranton and let my brother handle the store. If he's interested, he'll make a greater effort. You know, you put someone who is personally interested in making a growing concern of the business in charge, and it's bound to succeed. It's a great idea. We will open the store in Reading. Then follows another Woolworth store in Reading, one in Harrisburg, another in Trenton, others in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, all successful. Woolworth has developed his system of chain stores, and the five and ten has come to stay. Oh, well, uh, I uh, gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, I have called you together here in this meeting to discuss our plans for the future. I've made a survey of the United States for the F.W. Woolworth Company. 
We're about to venture on the greatest campaign of expansion we have yet known. And here on this map are marked those towns which are growing. Because they're growing? By. We have investigated carefully the best locations in each of these towns, the busiest streets. We have discovered that our clientele is changing. Formerly, only the poorer classes traded in the Woolworth stores. Today, every class trades in them. Our next store is going to be opened on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Why, uh, that's impossible. No, impossible? No. We're going to open right across the street from the public library. And we're going to open another store in Philadelphia, next door to Caldwell and Tiffany. We're going to bring every man, woman, and child in every city in the United States into Woolworth's five and ten cent store. Well, I'll put them downstairs. The Woolworth fortunes grow and grow. The next great stop is taken in 1912. Six men representing six companies are gathered around a table. Woolworth speaks. Well, Seymour, you want to sign first? Oh, well, thank you, Frank. There you are. Mm-hmm. Mr. Moore? Yeah, uh, surely, Frank. Pass the paper on around. Well, are you satisfied, gentlemen? Satisfied? Uh, not selling out to you? Why, why shouldn't we be? Over 600 stores now, Moore. That's a little different from the beginning, isn't it? That store in Utica. That's the reason why we're not sorry to sell out to you, Frank. Any of it. It was your idea, and you made it grow. It's really all yours. Mm, that's a very great tribute. I hope I deserve it. Well, everyone signed? Mm, yes, I think so. Good, good. Well, now I have a surprise for you. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. I'm going to erect a building, the tallest one in the world. It will cost more than $27 million, and it's going to be built from nickels and dimes. A building dedicated to you, my faithful friend. to go, pal. Ah, uh, do you think I've forgotten my job? Ain't you heard about the ceremony? Oh. The governor's coming up to watch the last rivet oh, go in. Uh, hey, give him the signal. Oh. Well, what's going on? Uh, don't I get to heat the last rivet? Oh, sure you does, and I'm doing the rivet. But the big bugs want to be on hand for having a flag race. The last goiter on the tallest building in the world. <laughs> That's something to tell your kids about. Hey, you said it. I never thought of that. A safe feat. Do you ever think what the Woolworth building's made of? Sure, sure, I talk. Steel and stone and rivets. No, you're wrong. It's nickels and dimes. That's what it's made of. Say, say that's right, yeah. You're a smart one, Tim, even if you're only a rivet eater. Sure. Now, look at those guys. <laughs> hey, hey, look. <laughs> there goes one of your high silk hats. <laughs> hey, I bet it'll land in Central Park. Yeah. Oh, you. <laughs> well, here we are, gentlemen. Is everything ready, Mr. Horowitz? Of course it is, Mr. Woolworth. There aren't any slips when the Thompson Starrett Company puts up a building, even if it is the tallest in the world. All right, foreman. Okay, Pete. Governor. I'd like to shake your hand. You're the man who finished the job for it. Oh, uh, thanks, Mr. Woolworth. Uh, uh, Murphy's my name. Uh, my partner'd like to shake hands with you, too. Uh, he done the heating. Uh, Tim, meet Mr. Woolworth. Uh, glad to know you, Miss Woolworth. Uh, well, uh, glad to know you. Shall we hoist the flag, Mr. Woolworth? Yes. And if you don't mind, I'd like to pull the rope. Steve 
Brooks down there, blowing the whistle. I'm taking it up in Hoboken, way over there in Brooklyn. What a tribute, Frank. What a thrill. Well, boys, there aren't many sights like this one. Look at all that. The whole of New York spread out before you. My dream has finally come true. We're atop the tallest building in the world. Frank is... He's almost sublime. Sublime fiddlesticks. It's the best advertisement we ever had. It's more than that, Frank. It's more than just the achievement of one man or one group of men. It's a signpost on the road to the future. It's a beacon for men to follow. It's a cathedral of commerce. <laughs> I guess I'm going sentimental. Well, that's about the finest thing anyone has ever said to me, Moore. Thank you. It's been a long time, but we've come a long way. Yes, we have. And now, what are your plans for the future? Do you remember years ago when I said we'd put a store in every city in the United States? Indeed, I do. Well, I hope sometime in the not-too-distant future to put a five and ten in every civilized town in the world. persisted in an idea until he made that idea the greatest merchandising accomplishment the world has ever seen. He was a pioneer, a trailblazer who won his way to the top. Frank W. Woolworth, Captain of Industry. <laughs> <laughs> 